Tonight we're going to look at two men. Now, not two men by name, but rather two types of men in the Bible, two types of people in the Bible. And I would suggest to you that if you're saved, you're in one of these two camps. So, um, broadly speaking, in the world today, there's two, there's two groups of people, right? You have what the Bible refers to as the natural man, uh, the old man, the um, lost man, the unsaved person. And then over here, you have the new man or the saved person. And then within that, I think there's two more groups of people, the foolish man and the blessed man. Okay, and they might be known by you know, different names at different times, but those are, those are your two people, the foolish man and the blessed man. And so tonight, before we jump into that, I want to define those two terms very quickly. The fool, as referred to in the Bible, uh, this is uh, Webster's definition of the word fool. There's one who does not exercise his reason. An idiot. <laughs> I love that he put that in there. It's really funny. If you go look up fool in Webster's 1828 dictionary, it says an idiot. It's quite funny. Anyway, and then it says, one who prefers trifling temporary pleasure to the service of God. One who prefers temporary pleasure to the service of God. And then he defined blessed this way, enjoying spiritual happiness and the favor of God. Enjoying spiritual happiness and the favor of God. That's how he defined the word blessed. So with that in mind... We're going to look at these two men tonight, the foolish man and the blessed man. But before we get started, let's ask God for his help tonight. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I do ask that you would be with me as I preach. Lord, that your Holy Spirit would fill me and help me to say only those things that are according to your will tonight and according to Scripture. Lord, I ask that you would use it in each and every one of our hearts tonight and help us to change those things that we need to change to draw closer to you. And Lord, we love you and we thank you and we ask these things in Christ. Amen. Okay, so the Bible says, let's read uh, Psalm 14. The Bible says, The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt, they have done abominable works, there is none that doeth good. The Lord looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand and seek God. They, they are all gone aside. They are all together become filthy. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. Have all the workers of iniquity no knowledge who eat up my people as they eat bread and call not upon the Lord? There are they in great fear, for God is in the generation of the righteous. Kind of funny. Ken told me to put in one of those Listerine strips, and I forgot. <laughs> he knows I struggle with a dry mouth for some reason. Anyway. So looking first at the foolish man, the foolish man. So we'll divide up into two points, and then we'll have several points underneath. So number one, the foolish man. Notice in verse one, I want you to see the foolish man, number one, says there is no God. There is no God. That's something that the foolish man says. Now, obviously, we're talking tonight about safe people. I believe everyone in this room has a salvation testimony. So we're going to focus on safe people tonight. So obviously, a safe person is not an atheist. By definition, they cannot be an atheist. And so we're going to skip over that. But um, so we can't necessarily, as a safe person, say there's no God, at least with our words. And I doubt that anyone in this room would ever say that. And you probably would never even think those words. That's not something that would come to your mind. But however, sometimes we scream those words with our actions. In Titus chapter number 1, in verse 16, Paul writes, they profess that they know God, but in works they deny him, being abominable and disobedient and unto every good work reprobate. Paul says there, hey, they say that they know God, they say they're a Christian, they say all these things, but then when it comes to their works, what they do, their actions, it speaks volumes and it, their actions say, hey, there is no God. Their actions, many times our actions as Christians, we live like there is no God. Our actions speak volumes, just like you have to bridle your tongue so you don't say those things that you shouldn't say, right? You also need to take charge of your actions so that your actions don't say things that they need not. As a Christian, our actions need to be very concise in pointing to Jesus Christ. The foolish man says there is no God. And so in thinking about that, we know in Psalm 
uh, Proverbs rather 9, in verse number 10, the Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. Okay, so wisdom has to do with knowledge that you can use for discerning, right? And applied wisdom is you use that knowledge practically to help you make decisions. And so wisdom brings with it knowledge, and, and this knowledge helps us to follow after God. Okay, so when you are a foolish man, you don't have this wisdom in your life, okay? Wisdom is the opposite of foolishness, right? Everyone following with me here? And so when you are wise, you've stepped outside of foolishness. Talking about spiritual wisdom here, when you're making godly decisions and your actions reflect that. When you sin, when you transgress against the commandments of God, you then leave wisdom and step back into foolishness. Just really practical stuff there. The foolish person says there is no God. They live like there is no God. Practically speaking, their life demonstrates that there is no God. What are your actions telling people? How do you live? So many people I hear, especially in modernistic Christianity today, they make the claims like, why why does it matter what I wear? Why does it matter what I listen to? Why does it matter where I go? Because your actions speak very loudly. Do your actions deny God? So, number one, the foolish man says there is no God. Number two, the foolish man does not seek to know God. The foolish man does not seek to know God. Look with me in verse number two again of Psalm 14 there. The Lord looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand and seek God. So God's looking down, and practically speaking, God never judges a situation blindly. The Bible talks about the eyes of the Lord are at every place, beholding the evil and the good. God is looking. God knows. Okay, so this isn't strange here at all. But it says he looked down to see if there were any that did understand and seek God. It's kind of interesting here. The wording almost implies an extra effort on God's part to try to find someone that was seeking after him. So what what does that tell us? It tells us that those that actually are committed to following after Christ are rather few. And of course, we know that. There are millions upon millions of Christians in the world today, people that are probably legitimately saved and on their way to heaven, but they have not made a decision to follow after Christ. They haven't got their actions in line, and so they have made a decision to not seek God. You see, there's no, there's no substitute for seeking after God. It isn't going to happen accidentally. You can't, you can't wake up one morning and just have this wonderful relationship with God. That's not going to happen. You're not going to have visions. You're not going to have dreams. These things aren't going to happen. The only way you can get to know God is through this book. That's the only way to know God. And I feel like we, we know that in our heads, but so many Christians, we go around waiting on this supernatural experience, perhaps, and like, okay, yeah, one day, one day, I'll be a great Christian. One day, one day, I'll be close to God. And we're not willing to put in the work now. So that word seek in verse number two there, where it says, did understand and seek God, that has the idea of intentionality to it. You have to make a decision. Okay, seeking isn't something that just happens by accident. It's the decision that you've made to go after something, a decision you've made to go find something. And so to seek is to go after, to go after God, to pursue God. Perhaps y'all heard it um, about a month ago. Anyone familiar with the TV show Fixer Upper? Okay, a couple of you. Anyway, uh, <laughs> there are two people, Chip and Joanna Gaines, and they go around fixing up people's houses. It's kind of fun to watch. Uh, they claim to be Christians. Um, there's a few spatterings of religious words in the TV show every now and then. Um, I wasn't, you know, terribly convinced, but. On a YouTube, I remember a few months ago, I saw a video that was their testimony, and it was at their church. And so I watched it, and afterwards, I still wasn't very convinced. There was no mention of the gospel at any time. They just had this experience, you could say, and then they were close to God. But a couple of weeks ago, Oprah Winfrey did an interview with them, and she asked Chip, the husband, she said, how do you have a relationship with God? And his answer... (laughs) was very sad, really, and I'm paraphrasing here. But basically, he said, 
you know, I've never been one of those people that like reads the Bible for 20 hours a week, but who is for that matter? But <laughs> I've never been one of those people who reads the Bible for 20 hours a week, and I'm a very simple guy, and I like simple things. So I meet with God when I'm out in the field or like when I'm delivering a calf on my ranch or something like that, and then I feel like God's speaking to me. God's not speaking to him through that. Now, sure, you can, you can appreciate God's creation when you're out in nature and you can appreciate his majesty, but you're not getting to know God. There's no substitute for it. It's not going to happen by accident. It's only through this book. Now, some people, some Christians have made the decision to stay right where they are. They're going to be complacent. And complacency is the hallmark of mediocrity, right? If you're going to be a complacent Christian, you're going to be a mediocre Christian. You're going to be lukewarm, you're not going to do great things for God. You're not going to see people saved. And the, one of the big problems with complacency is like, well, I think I'm good enough. I think I've gone far enough. You know, I go to church now. I give enough now. And yeah, I'm just going to stay right here. One of the problems with that is you don't stay right there. If you stop, automatically you start going backwards. Right. Complacency. Some might call it Apathy. You have to make a decision to seek God. I thought about it this way. Uh, husbands, perhaps your wife has a to-do list for you, right? And uh, there's things on it like paint the outside of the house or cut the grass or, I don't know, fix this piece of flooring. Um, I know sometimes I get rounded up for that. But, you know, something like that, you know, and maybe she plasters this to-do list on the refrigerator for you somewhere, you know, nice and conspicuous so you can see it every day and be reminded. Well, <laughs> Well, you see this list, and you're like, yeah, yeah, the grass does need to be cut. That's a good thing to do. Yeah, I do need to fix, replace that light bulb, and oh, yeah, that needs to be done too. But, you know, I'm going to get to that later, and you don't do it. Why don't you do it? You don't want to. You don't feel like it. The same is true in our Christian life. We know that we need to be in church. We know that we need to give. We know that we need to share the gospel. We know that we need to be in our Bible every day. We know that we need to pray but we don't do it. Why? We don't want to. We don't want to so oftentimes. The Christian life is about more than your desires. You have to get out in front of your desires as a Christian, right? You can't live by your feelings, okay? Feelings lead to very mediocre life, okay? You have to get out in front of that. You have to choose. As we said earlier, it's a decision. You have to choose to seek after God. You have to choose to know God. It's a very intentional pursuit. Once again, it will not happen by accident. You will not wake up spiritual one day. If you long to be a spiritual Christian, you must be in God's word. So number one, the foolish man says there's no God. Number two, the foolish man doesn't seek to know God. Number three, the foolish man is enslaved to his sin. The foolish man is a slave to his sin. Notice with me in verse number one again, there in the second part, it says, they are corrupt, they have done abominable works, there is none that doeth good. Down in verse three, they are all gone aside, they are all together become filthy, there is none that doeth good, no, not one. Okay, and David here isn't saying, you know, people in general don't do good things, you know, all righteousness are as filthy rags, we know that from the New Testament. That's not what David's saying here, he's saying these people are wicked, these people are constantly evil, okay? It reminds me of over in uh, Genesis chapter 6 where God's about to destroy the earth with the flood and he tells uh, Noah that the only imagination of the thoughts of people's hearts is evil continually. Remember that? That's kind of what it reminded me of when I read this. Okay, people living in wickedness and evilness. The foolish man is a slave to his sin, a slave to his fleshly desires, if you will, um, when you get off the path of righteousness, you get off the path of following after God, you have to turn to something. And we'll get to this more in a minute, but you have to turn to something. And if you're not serving God, by default you're serving yourself, and that only leads into a life of wickedness. The foolish man is a slave to his sin. So entangled by his sin, it constantly consumes his thoughts and desires. He's driven by his selfish wishes. Notice there in verse number three, where it says they are all gone aside. You see that word aside there? It kind of stuck out to me. You know, you're walking down the path, something catches your eye over here and you turn aside. 
That's how easy it is to deviate from the path. Now, you can get right back on. God will accept you back out of your sin. You, there's instant forgiveness and there's instant restoration, and I love that. It's wonderful. It's not a license to sin, but it's a comfort to know when we do. God will accept us back. But so oftentimes, the Christian steps off the path and continues on down it. And for a while, you know, he can still see the path over there that he was supposed to be on. And, you know, church over there, and he can still see, but after a while, it just gets too far away. Stay on the path. Don't become a slave to those desires. Now, obviously, we as Christians, we can live in victory. There's no need to be a slave to sin. Um, We are not lost people. We're not heathens. We can do what God would have us to do, and we ought to. But it doesn't mean that temptation's not still real. Oftentimes, it very much is. A lot of people fall into habitual sins and addictions, but God has the power to raise you out of that if you will simply allow him to. Don't be a slave to sin. And lastly, I want you to notice quickly that the foolish man lives in fear. The foolish man lives in fear. Now, this is kind of kind of the last thing here, but if you'll notice in verse number five, where it says, there were they in great fear, for God is in the congregation of the righteous. Okay, so you've, you've decided not to follow after God. You've decided to deviate from the path and go into sin. Well, God's over here in the congregation of the righteous, and you're away from him. When you're away from God and in sin, it's a lonely place. It's a scary place. It's a fearful place. The foolish man lives in fear. Why why is he a fool for living in fear? Well, as I just said, there's instant forgiveness and restoration. You don't have to live in fear. The fool chooses to stay there. The fool chooses to stay there. So that is the foolish man. There's much more in the scripture we could go into for sure. Proverbs has an awful lot to say about what a foolish man does. But we're just taking for sake of time out of this one passage. Now if you'll turn with me over to Psalm number one. Psalm number one. And we'll look at the blessed man. Remember what we said about the blessed man? Someone who lives in the happiness of spirituality and has the favor of God. Let's read Psalm 1 together, shall we? And the Bible says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. And so tonight we're going to focus on that first couple of verses there, one through three mainly. But let's notice the blessed man, what he does. First and foremost, let's see here. The blessed man delights in the word of God. The blessed man delights in the word of God, delights in the Bible. You see that very clearly in verse number two there. His delights in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. Okay, so there's, there's a love, okay? Uh, now that word delight there uh, signifies a more permanent pleasure than like happiness, okay? Delight is like a very deep um, type of happiness, okay? It's, um, it's not deviated by your feelings and your emotions. It has the power to endure even after a period of excitement, okay? Makes sense? And so delight just continues. And it carries with it also the idea of making a decision to delight in something, to love something. That's more of the verb form of it, but delight carries with it the decision, and it's more long-lasting than just regular happiness. And so the blessed man takes delight. He has delight in the Word of God. He loves the Bible. He loves the counsel of God. Uh, This man not only admits there is a God, but loves Him and delights in spending time with Him as well. Now, we already talked about this a little bit in the beginning with our last point, but the blessed man, by default, must must spend time with God. In Psalm 119, verse 14, the Bible says, I have rejoiced 
in the way of thy testimonies, in as much as in all riches. In verse 16 of that passage, I will delight myself in thy statutes. I will not forget thy word. Verse 47, I will delight myself in thy commandments, which I have loved. You see there David writing once again, and he said, first, I love the testimonies. I love thy statutes. I love thy commandments. In other words, he loves all of it, okay? He doesn't take one part and apply it to his life and throw the rest away. He loves all of the Bible. He applies all the Bible to his life. He meditates in all of the word of God. It's very biblical seeking the whole counsel of God. There's not one part that needs to be studied more. We need it all in our life. The Bible says it is all profitable unto us. We need to take delight in the word of God. And as we said earlier, you must set aside this time. You must. There's no other way to know God. And number two, the blessed man uh, delights in the word of God. The blessed man also seeks to know God. In direct contrast to the foolish man who didn't seek to know God, the blessed man does. In fact, it's one of his main pursuits. This man pursues a deeper knowledge of God. He desires to meditate on the word of God. You see that in the second part of uh, the second verse there of Psalm 1. He meditates day and night. What does that carry with it? It carries with it the idea that he actually knows the Bible, okay? If you don't know something, you can't meditate on it. Now, um, <clears throat> let's define meditate really quick. The world's definition of meditation is to empty your mind, right? Like, mm, okay, that's what the world, <laughs> the world's definition. To empty your mind, right? And I find it interesting that all of those religions that teach that, those are the devil's religions, right? I find it interesting that he has them all emptying their mind. You know, that's kind of interesting to me. But anyway, so the world's definition of meditation, empty your mind. The Bible's definition is to fill your mind with the Bible. Amen. Fill your mind with the Bible. And of course, the only way to do that is to spend time daily in the Word of God. Consistency. You must be consistent to the Word of God. And you must learn it, memorize it, read it, study it. Those are all different things. You need to spend some personal time with God every day where you just read the Bible and let him speak to you. You need to spend some time where you study the Bible, dig into meanings and stuff like that of words and find out things that you don't understand. Then you need to spend some time memorizing the word of God. Get it into your heart and into your mind. So then you can meditate on it throughout the day. Obviously, no one can read the Bible 24-7, but we can think on it. We can't think on the Bible throughout the day. And so a good way to gauge that is what do you think on throughout the day? You know, usually we're all thinking about something always, right? I mean, occasionally I know a lot of guys, they'll go to what's called the nothing box, right? We have that little space that we go to. But, you know, for the most part throughout the day, we're all thinking about something. What consumes the majority of your thoughts? It should be, it should be spiritual things. It should be the Word of God. It need not be the garbage that the world feeds to us. That is a direct obstacle to being a blessed man that rather feeds the foolish side of man. I'd say, meditate on the word of God. Psalm 63, verse 1, O God, thou art my God, early will I seek thee. My soul thirsteth for thee, my flesh longeth for thee in a dry and thirsty land where no water is. Psalm 119, verse 97, O how I love thy law, it is my meditation all the day. 119, verse 12, blessed art thou, O Lord, teach me thy statutes. Verse 15, I will meditate in thy precepts and have respect unto thy ways. Verse 30, I have chosen the way of truth. Thy judgments have I laid before me. What's the point? You got to work on it. You need to desire it and get out in front of your desires and choose to do it. Choose to do it. Work on it. It is work. It is work sometimes. Sometimes we lack the desire to do it, as we already talked about. Sometimes you just got to push through anyway. Sometimes I don't feel like coming to church. Sometimes I don't feel like getting up in the morning and having my time with God. But you have to do it anyway. The blessed man delights in the word of God. The blessed man seeks to know God. And finally and quickly, the blessed man, his way will prosper. His way will prosper. We see that in verse number three. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Now, what does that mean for you? Well, only God knows the specifics of that, right? I'm not saying that God's going to make you abundantly wealthy or anything like that. Surely we don't believe that. But God will 
bless you in what you're doing. God will give you the ability to do what he's called you to do. God will take care of you if you are following after him. God clearly states many times in Scripture, and specifically in the New Testament, like with the apostles, he told them what to do, and he said that he would be with them and that he would take care of them. God will do the same for us. God will take care of us. And may I submit, if you're not seeing any fruit in your life, you're not seeing any people saved, you're not having the ability to see God at work in your life, it's time to get closer to him. Seek God. Seek God's desire to know him. Delight yourself in his word. I know it's extremely simple, extremely simple tonight, but we as Christians, we want to be blessed, don't we? We want to see God's blessing in our life, and we want God to use us mightily. The Christian life's daily. It's a daily thing. It's a daily decision. It's not one time and you're done. It's not a quick sprint. It's a marathon. It's a constant journey until we get home to heaven. And while there are Maybe things along the way, you know, sometimes there'll be an extraordinary day where you'll see someone saved. Other times, most of the time, it'll just be an ordinary day where it's just you and God and you're going to work and you're following after him. But even so, meditate on the scriptures, delight in God's word, and he will prosper you. 